I want to start this morning by telling you of a, of a time in which Yvonne and I were on a, a missions trip deep in India. Uh, we went deep into the interior of India, a um, place called Arunachal Pradesh, which is north of India and just south of China. In fact, it's a disputed territory. If you look at Google from India, it says India owns it. If you look at it from China, China says that they own this territory. It was a, a super remote place. And um, at one point on our travels, we're told by the locals, I'm not sure if this is true or not, we're told that we're the first Western people ever to set foot in that village. Um, any of the Westerners that came, came that way, um, they said, would just kind of pass right on through the village. They would never stop at this, this small place. But we stopped because there was a believing family in the village that we, we visited that day. And in fact, here I have a picture of the encounter uh, that we had. Um, you can see all those people are looking at us because we were like the, the object of, of newness there or something. We were the strange one that, that, that came there. And, and people were taking videos and pictures of us. Um, in, in fact, I, I know that uh, even here I capture this picture where even the locals were giving their cameras to our, our guide, our pastor Stephen Fish, and then he would turn around and he'd take pictures of us that they might take those pictures home and, and share them with their, their families um, at, at night. So, hey, look what I saw. I saw this Western. He was in the town. And um, it was really an incredible trip. Um, and uh, so we traveled then further deeper into the country. We we came along houses that looked like this. They, they were essentially bungalows, like everybody lived in these wood houses. And the amazing thing is, in every single one of these houses, what was right in the middle? <laughs> Remember? A fire! They had a stove right in the middle. Now, boy, if something caught, that thing would be up in smoke in no time at all. Uh, we spent a few days living in a house just like that. If they were all like that, kind of a big open room a veranda around the outside, all made of uh, wood, and we spent some days training pastors and teaching people in the church, and uh, you know, if you look closely at, uh, at, uh, at the house, right there, you've got a flag, and, and what does that flag look like? It looks like the sun, and that indeed is the representation of a sun, because in those villages, there were sun worshipers, and clearly, they put the sun up there, they put their flag up there, it says, we're worshipers of the sun. Um, but people were beginning to come to Christ in those villages, and when they came to Christ, those flags came down because they were no longer worshiping um, the sun, and what a joy it was to fellowship with those in the, the church who were turning from their sun worship to worship the true sun, right? the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, my purpose this morning isn't so much to tell you about my trip as much as it is to say that we were deep way back into India and so that, that our travels home is what I want to just mention about. But I felt like I couldn't say I was on a mission trip one time in the travel home and not tell you these great stories of the, the encounters we had. But we were so deep in India when we said, okay, well, we're done here. We're going to go home. It took us four days to get home. Uh, the first day was from the mountains, and it took us really a whole day to drive down and then across the ferry, which I know Yvonne loved, right? We, Went across the ferry. She was checking out the life preservers where they were because we were an overpacked ferry. But it took us a day to come down and cross the ferry to get into a town that had an airport. And uh, this airport had one flight out every day to New Delhi, which is where we could get on our, our big plane to fly to, uh, to London and then to Chicago. So we're one day down the mountain, one day to um, Delhi, and then Delhi we laid over in, in London. I suppose we could have got home in three days if we really wanted to, but we reached home at last. It took us four days to get home from this trip, but, but four days is nothing like the trip that Paul took on his way to Rome. It took Paul several years during his trip. The title of my message this morning is Rome at Last. Just as we got home at last, so also Paul finally gets to Rome and you can uh, open your Bibles, if you will, to Acts chapter 28. We're nearing the end of, of Acts, and by the way, after we finish with Acts, we're going to go on to, Ro to uh, Revelation, so it's the, the next book we're going to be looking at. Um, but since Paul's days in Ephesus, he had his mind set upon going to Rome. This is a verse I've referred to you several times, Acts chapter 29 and verse, Acts chapter 19, verse 21. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in his spirit 
Paul resolved in the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit was stirring him, to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and to go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So Macedonia, Achaia, Jerusalem, and then Rome was his desire. And, and that's what he wanted to do. And it took him a few years actually to take that journey. Just want to take a few moments to track that journey. Remember, Paul was on his third missionary journey. He was there in Ephesus when he resolved in the Spirit to go to Macedonia. You see Macedonia up north, and then Achaia is down the south, which is modern-day Greece, and uh, then to Jerusalem, and then to Rome. And, and on our map, right there is Ephesus. It's near the western border of Asia Minor, which is um, actually Turkey today. And, and when then it came time for Paul to leave, Paul said farewell to those in Ephesus and departed from Macedonia. And after spending a bit of time in Macedonia, then Paul traveled to Achaia, is where he traveled. And he was there for three months. And then he referred, turned back to uh, Macedonia from where he came. And then he crossed the Aegean Sea and came to Troas. You remember what happened in Troas? It's one event there. What happened in Troas? The Macedonia, that was before the Macedonian call. This is where Eutychus, sleeping and fell out of the window because Paul preached long late into the night in that hot, stuffy room filled with candles. And then he traveled then south to Miletus, uh, which is where he met the Ephesian elders, just quickly because he wanted to get back to Jerusalem for the time of Pentecost. And then uh, we, we read that he came straight to Kos and then Rhodes and then to Patera, and Paul and his companions found a ship heading to Phoenicia, which they boarded. They went to Tyre and to Caesarea, and then finally to Jerusalem, finishing Paul's third missionary journey. But there he was in Ephesus. He says, i got to go to Macedonia, and then Achaia, and then I'm going to Jerusalem. It's really the, the third leg of his trip. He'd made it there, and now he was headed to Rome. Now his, his trip to Rome wasn't quite like he had planned. I, I'm sure he planned to travel there on his own free will, but Paul, as you remember, in our, our recent weeks, he went there as a prisoner to stand trial before Caesar. And, and, and before he actually left for Rome, he was two years in a prison in Caesarea. So here this, this trip that could have just taken just a couple months, maybe six months, all of a sudden it's taken almost two and a half years um, that, that he was, was taking, taking. And for the last couple of weeks at Rock Valley Bible Church, we've been tracking his trip to Rome, it, it began there in Caesarea where he was uh, in prison for, for two years and he was uh, boarded a ship under the watch of a centurion named Julius along with Luke, the author of the book of Acts, and then Aristarchus who was a Macedonian from Thessalonica. And he embarked on that journey, headed north to Sidon and then he traveled to Myra and the ship did and then the Myra and then from Myra changed ships and sailed to Canidus and then he went down to this uh, the island of Crete landed at Fair Havens. Now this whole time the winds were contrary and, and it was a difficult journey and so that's why they got to Fair Havens but it wasn't a good place to spend the winter. Um, and so they, they, they took off hoping to head to Phoenix where they spend the, the winter there just a another port on the edge of Crete. But even as they got there, then the winds were, were bad and they were blown off course into the open sea where the storm tossed them all about. And we, we looked at that when we were in Acts chapter 27. It was so bad that they threw their cargo overboard to lighten their ship. And, and after two weeks of enduring the storm, it says in Acts 27 and verse 20, that all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. He was there just... Ready, they're they're ready to die. They're ready to, they just drown in the ocean is what their their uh, thought was. But then, in the providence of God, they they their course was set to this small island called Malta, and it's here that they they ran ashore, smashing their boat into pieces, but saving all 276 people who were on board the boat. And, and last week, we looked at the, the 10 verses of Paul spending in Malta, and we saw that the miracles were happening there. Remember, Paul was bitten by a, a poisonous viper, and yet he survived, even when all the islanders thought, oh, he's, he's not going to survive, he's going to die. And he survived. And then Paul was, was put up in the, in the home of Publius, Publius the, the, the leader of the island. And uh, his father was ill, and uh, Paul prayed for him, and his Fever and dysentery left him instantaneously. Just a miracle of Paul and all on the island. Just over the three months in which they were there on the island, there were many who had diseases were coming to Luke and Paul were being cured. That was during their three months there on, on Malta. And then after that, they, they headed north to Rome. And it's right here that our, our text begins. 
Acts chapter 28, verse 11. And after three months, that is three months on the island of Malta, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as figureheads. And putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there we made the circuit and arrived at Regium. And, and after one day, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to Puteoli. And there we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers also, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Apius and the three taverns to meet us. And on seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when he came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Now it's from these first verses that I, I get the first point this morning, just Paul traveling to Rome. This is just, just Paul from Malta. This is just this quick travel to Rome. It took a week and a half, maybe. Not, not very long. Um, in, in verse 11, we read of this different boat that they, they embarked upon to leave to Malta. It was a different boat than they arrived on. You remember the boat that they arrived on was, was smashed by the rocks. And this boat was a ship of Alexandria, as it says in verse 11. And we see the curious fact about this boat. Now, we don't know why Luke included this, but he did. He says it had the twin gods as a figurehead. The twin gods were Castor and Pollux, the patron deities who protect them from the dangers of the sea. I mean, they're considered by sailors to be a sign of good fortune in a storm. And uh, I don't know why Luke put it there, because of course he and his traveling companions weren't, weren't looking and trusting these idols for another storm that might come upon them. They, they were trusting in the Lord. The, the same Lord who brought them to Malta would bring them safely to Rome. And so they sail in the ship, again, right? They, they sailed putting in at, at Syracuse, and after three days of being with the people there, they went up to Regium, and the next game, day they came up to Puteoli. And verse Verse 14 tells us that there we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. There were Christians in this town of Puteoli. The gospel had spread. Now, we don't know who brought the gospel to Puteoli, but we know how it came. It came the same way that the gospel always comes. It, it comes by people being faithful witnesses of Christ. This is a great application of the book of Acts, right? Jesus calls us to be my witnesses. And, and somehow, in some way, right, someone told someone, or maybe told someone else, who witnessed about Jesus Christ, him raised from the dead to believe in him, receive forgiveness of sins, and, and somehow someone went there, shared the gospel. God opened their hearts and their minds to embrace Jesus, this crucified Messiah, who's dead on the cross and buried, but yet risen from the dead, that we might have hope. Right? And those in Purioli believed and experienced the forgiveness of sins. And we don't know who brought the gospel to them. Only God knows. But here's a, here's a super encouraging thing, right? Because your ministry to other people, right? As you speak the gospel to others, you may be one of these unnamed people like Purioli. Right? Maybe someday a family looks back and so, like, who shared the, who shared the gospel with Grandma? Who was that again? Uh, we don't know. But God knows. And you may have had been the opportunity to be the one to share the gospel there. And your name won't be written down in, in any other book. You won't have any notoriety. But God knows your faithfulness. And, and through your words, as the, the gospel spread here to Pudioli, so also your words can help spread the gospel, push God's ping, kingdom a little bit further than ever before. Now, in Puteoli, wasn't the only city where there were believers. There are also believers in the, the Forum of Apius and the, the Three Taverns, two cities on the way to Rome. You can see them there. They're, on the map, it's Three Taverns and Ap Forum. Uh, in our text in the ESV, it's the Apius Forum is, is what it is. But these were, were um, other um, believers in these other cities. And they came, actually, to Puteoli to greet Paul. They said, oh, Paul has arrived? And they walked down... To meet Paul, verse 15, you can just look at it there. It says this, And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the forum of Apius and the three taverns to meet us. And on seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And, and presumably, if you read in the text, the, the, the assumption is that they came down to meet Paul, and then they walked with Paul the 40 miles or so as he went 
to Rome. They ushered him into the city, if you will. And the question that comes to mind, well, how are all these people aware of Paul? How do they know about Paul? I mean, it's one thing for believers to be present in a city. It's another thing to be those believers in the city, right, that never seen Paul before. Paul had never been to Rome. To be so excited that Paul had come to them, that they walked and greeted Paul and, and sought to bring him into Rome. It's, it's amazing. How, how could that be? Well, the answer is across your page. If you've got Acts 28 here, the answer is right here in the book of, of Romans, right? Because Paul wrote this letter to them about the same time, it was actually when Paul was in Macedonia, remember when he was in Ephesus? About the same time he was in Ephesus, when he'd gone to Macedonia and then into Achaia, I think it was in Achaia that he wrote this letter to Rome, just saying, hey, I, I, wanna, I wanna be there, I, I, wanna, I wanna get to Rome. In, in fact, even if you look just right over the page in Romans chapter one and verse 15, it says, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Romans chapter 1, verse 15. It's a good summary of the book of, of Romans. In fact, for those of you who are in our days, when we preached through the, the book of Romans, right, you, you saw this display up over and over and over again. Eager to preach the gospel, right? The book of Romans. And, and the idea here, you got different people, different sizes, all different sorts of, of, of types of people come across your path. Paul was eager to preach the gospel. And the reason was clear, as Paul says, Romans 1, it's 16 and 17, it's right there, right? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Indeed, the gospel is powerful. It's powerful to forgive us our sins. It's powerful to give us the the ability to conquer our sins. It's powerful to bring us to heaven. In fact, that's what the, the, the book of Romans is all about. It's about the power of the gospel. You, you can see on, the, on the, the slide there, right? We got six S words, right? Sin, salvation, sanctification, security, sovereignty, and service. That's the outline of, of Romans. Paul began in Romans 1 through 3, talking about sin, how we're all in sin and under its bondage and condemnation. And then Paul continues in Romans chapters 3 through 5, to speak about salvation, how, how it comes by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ that we can be saved from our sins. And then he talks about sanctification in Romans 6 and 7, how we should consider ourselves dead to sin and yet alive to God, and yet Romans 7 speaks about the ever-present reality of our struggle in sanctification, that it's slow and it's hard. And then in Romans chapter 8, we see that Paul's addressing the security in Christ, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, and we are nothing can separate us from his love. And then Romans 9 through 11, devoted to talking about the sovereignty of God in our salvation. That God will have mercy upon whom he has mercy. And then closes up with this call, Romans 12 through 16, of the application of the gospel is service. What God calls all of us to do is to be outward looking and to be serving others. And this letter was received by those in Rome. And, and apparently, right, shared with those in the, the surrounding cities, the form of Apius and three taverns and Pudioli. And this letter, right, must have been a blessing to them that they heard, Paul, the one who wrote this letter to Romans, is here? And, and, and it took no problem for them to get up and go and meet the human author of this letter. They had expected Paul to come. In fact, if you look at the end of Romans, Romans chapter 15, verse 23 in 24, verse 22, he says, this is the reason why I have so often been hindered to coming to you, right? I, I want to come to you, but I've been hindered. But now, since I no longer have any room <clears throat> for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, and Paul's thinking, okay, so here I am in Achaia, I'm going to go back up to Macedonia, I'm going to go to Troas, Miletus, and I'm going to get to Jerusalem, and then after I'm Jerusalem, then I'm going to come to you in Rome, and he's sending this letter ahead so they'd be ready for him. And he says, verse 24, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. <clears throat> in other words, he, he wants to get to Rome, but Rome's not his destination. There are already believers there, right? He wanted to go and preach the gospel where Christ had never been preached before. 
He, he wanted to go beyond. He wanted to go way west to Spain. It was the westernmost part of the, the known world at that time is what he wanted to do. And though Paul had never seen them face to face, he said he, want to go and see, he wants to go and see them <clears throat> and be helped by them, that is, be helped physically, financially, with contact, with resources, right? To, it's a missionary letter, it's the book of Romans. I, I, I'm telling you the gospel I'm going to preach. I'm coming, I want you to help me on my way because I want to go to Spain. And though now he was coming as a prisoner and us a free man, those in Rome would have rejoiced in, in, in meeting Paul. Like, yes, he said he was going to come. He, he promised, he, he wanted to come. This was his heart. And now he is finally here. And they're coming from these cities, merely a, a demonstration of their admiration for Paul. They were eager for his fellowship and eager to know him and eager maybe to ask more about the book of Romans. I mean, this is really like maybe all the Bible they had. They had the Old Testament for sure. There were Jews in Rome, right? But this is, this is what they had in the New Testament. And, just, just long, and, and by the way, Romans is sufficient if that's all you had as your Bible, your New Testament Bible for sure. Uh, but we see them reaching Rome at last. Verse 16. Says, and when they came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who guarded him. So Paul wasn't free to travel about Rome like he had wanted to. Remember when he was in Athens, he wandered about the city being provoked by the idols. And when he was at other places, he went into synagogues and preached the gospel there. Um, or he went to the open squares or healed people as he did in Lystra or various places. But when he came to Rome, right, he couldn't go to the synagogue, he couldn't go to the open square. He was there in prison with a soldier who guarded him. He wasn't free like he'd hoped, but he was there and he had made it and people all knew about it. And in fact, we're going to see next week when we look at verses 30 and 31 is that people were coming to Paul and he was preaching to them the kingdom of God for two years right there in, um, in Rome without hindrance. But the rest of the chapter tells us all about what Paul did in Rome. We have seen Paul right traveling to Rome, and now my, my second point, I just say it's informing the Jews, verse 17 through 22. We see in verse 17, after three days, it's pretty quick after Paul got there to Rome, uh, he called together the, the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the custom of our fathers, Yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. And for this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak to you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain here we see Paul just informing the local Jewish leaders about why it is he's in Rome. And he begins by saying, listen, I've done nothing wrong. Right? I mean, that's how every prisoner starts off. No, I'm innocent. And Paul really was. He said, but I, I've done nothing wrong. And he summarizes his, his whole experience in Jerusalem of being, you know, this mob coming against him and accusing him and then and then being up to the Romans, and they didn't find anything, and back and forth kind of was. He just kind of summarized everything that, that happened since he was seized in that temple, uh, in the temple area. And if you remember, right, he was, he was falsely then accused of being a disturber of the peace, a, a leader of a false religion, and a profaner of the temple. Remember, that was the accusation that's brought to, against Paul by, by the, the Jews when, Fest, when Felix was governing over his trial, and and none of these were true. And, and Paul said, listen, right, I, I brought up and these accusations are against me, but, but none of them are true. Paul then explained in, in, in verse 18, right, they, they examined me. They, they wanted to put me to liberty. They wanted to release me. Um, the Romans were willing to release him, but the Jews wanted him killed. And the only way that Paul could reserve his life is to appeal to Caesar, right? And when Festus... Um, Heard those words when Paul says, I appeal to Caesar, then he said those, those famous words, right? To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. And finally now, he has gone um, from Jerusalem as a prisoner to Caesar. This trip has taken at least three months because that's how long they were in Malta. At least two weeks and three months because that's how long the, the ship was gone. It was about four or five months or so he's been on this journey 
But the very first thing he does when he gets there, right, is, is he summons the Jews to come and talk to them, like having a, a pretrial hearing, if you will. And, and he, he has hopes of persuading the Jews to his side. Again, if you look at verse 20, this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it's because of the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. And remember, that, that echoes back to what Paul said when he was accused, when he said, it's for the hope of the resurrection that I'm on trial today. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees right, argued against each other, and there's this big uproar. But he's saying, no, it's the hope of Israel. It's the hope of the Messiah. This Messiah has come, and, and, and this is what Israel's been hoping for, and he's here, and that's why I'm here, is because I believe that the Messiah has come. And don't miss the fact here as he says that I'm wearing this chain. Right? We often can just kind of not get the picture. Is it Paul just kind of came in here, and yes, maybe he's under arrest, but he's got a chain around his, his wrists, maybe chained around his legs. He's in shackles. Bound in shackles, requesting these local Jewish leaders in Rome to come and just, just talk with me. And we see the response there in verse 21 and 22. They said to him, we received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here as reporters spoke in any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you and what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Right? They hadn't received any forewarning that Paul was coming. You remember that was the whole, the whole deal about why Paul stood before Agrippa's because Festus had said, well, right, he's appealed to Caesar, but I need to sell him to Caesar, but I think he's innocent, but the Jews say that he's guilty. I don't even know. Agrippa, can you help me? I, I, need, to, I need to write something because, he says, in uh, Acts chapter 26, um, kind of 25, when he said, um, therefore, I brought him before you, King Agrippa, especially before you, right? Because you're a Jew, you understand these things. So that after we examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. And uh, apparently, he hadn't figured it out. He just said, well, let's just send him there. Maybe it'll figure it out on the way. I, I don't even know. But he's going there as a prison. Rome didn't know that he was coming. Um, no one had heard anyone speak badly of Paul. In fact, if anything, there was a good reputation of Paul, maybe among the, the Christians who were there, but somehow that didn't even really get to the Jewish leaders. But they did know about this sect, uh, this, this partial of Judaism, as they called it, that didn't have a, a good reputation. This sect, this Christianity was spoken everywhere against. And the sense here is that these Jews don't know why it's spoken against. They, they just sort of like, well, you know, they're in the Jewish circles, right? Kind of like we have today, right? If you stay in your bubble, your, your, whatever, your YouTube feed or your Twitter feed or whatever, you stay in your bubble, you just kind of hear, and these guys were in their bubble. They were just Jewish people. Oh, that's bad, that's bad. Like, but, but they didn't know why it was bad. And though, so they said, verse 22, we desire to hear from you on what your views are. We want to hear them. And so, apparently, there was this date that was appointed in verse 23, in which the, the Jewish leaders, the local Jewish leaders, are going to assemble to hear Paul out. And this is my, my third point this morning, not only the, the traveling to Rome and the invitation to the Jews, but also teaching the Jews as well. Verse 23, when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. That is, it's more than just the local leaders of the synagogue, right? There are people in the synagogues who are interested in hearing these sorts of things, and so they went to him as well. And verse 23 continues, From morning until evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. How I wish someone had... a a recorder, and recorded that meeting. This would have been a, a great Bible seminar, if you will, right? Paul taking the Old Testament and explaining the kingdom of God to these Jews, trying to convince them about Jesus. Does this remind you of any passage maybe you heard before? It reminds me of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. In Luke chapter 24, when these dejected disciples didn't quite understand their need for Jesus to die and 
rise again from the dead. They, they told this stranger walking along the way who was Jesus himself disguised so they couldn't recognize him. How dejected, like, oh, we were hoping he's going to be the one who redeemed Israel, but he, he died, and, right? But, but yet some women went to the tomb and they found that his body wasn't there, and they were just confused. And Jesus said in Luke 24, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? Luke 24, 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now that conversation there wouldn't have been an all-day conversation, but would have been a, a walk alongside the road, kind of stop and and maybe a couple hour conversation. We're not exactly sure. But, but later, right, when he was with them, Acts chapter, Luke chapter 24, 44, it says he said to them, um, verse 45, he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. He said, these are my words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Thus is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day, rise from the dead. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to, na to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. It's what He says, right? It's necessary. This is what the Old Testament taught. From Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, it's necessary for the Messiah to come and suffer and die. It's necessary for him to rise again, and it's necessary for you all to be witnesses to proclaim his name among the nations. Verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. And then like Acts starts, because the, the ending of, of Luke is a little bit like the beginning of Acts, kind of ties it together. He says, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power on high. And we know, of course, that's when the Holy Spirit comes and empowers them and stirs them to speak with tongues on the day of Pentecost and then to scatter out and to preach the gospel. Paul was doing the same thing. You know, maybe he got notes from the oops, maybe he got notes from the other apostles who were there. Uh, what did Jesus say? Because he was with them for 40 days explaining about the kingdom of God. And so he's writing it down. He's got one day. He's got to take this, this 40 day course that the disciples were taught that were passed on to him. He's taking this 40 day course, putting it down into one day. And it would have been just absolutely Packed, as Paul in verse 23 says, he was explaining from the law of Moses and the prophets, teaching about the kingdom of God. You just got to think, where, where would he go? What would he talk about? What would he say? Maybe he'd start Genesis 3.15, which we looked at this Christmas season a little bit, right? The tells of God's plan for the Redeemer. Though, though Satan would strike him on the heel, the seed of the woman would deal the death blow to Satan. And there's the promise of the Messiah that came about in Jesus. Paul would have continued on to passages like, like Genesis 12, which speak about the call of Abraham. When God promised to bless him, saying, in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth should be blessed. Paul said later in Galatians 3 that this is God preaching the gospel beforehand to Abraham. That, that from his line would come the Messiah. The Messiah who would be a Jew, who, who would then, right, Bring blessing to all the world, to all who believe. The one who believes in the Messiah would be blessed of the Lord. This is the, the blessing that came through Abraham. Or maybe he, he first started with the big covenants, right? The, the Abrahamic covenant. Or maybe with the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. When God promised that through the line of David would rise a king and that he would build his house and his king would sit upon his throne forever and ever. And maybe he continued on to Jeremiah 33 in the New Covenant, which God says that he's going to put in a new, a new heart within you. And, and that was Jesus. Jesus is doing, he's transforming us from within. His teaching when he was here was all about inward, inward things rather than just outward things. That's the New Covenant. Maybe in this one day seminar, Paul would have gone to the Psalms, picked out Psalms like um, Psalm 22, which details the, the crucifixion of Jesus. Or maybe Psalm 16, which details the resurrection of Jesus. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And Jesus didn't undergo decay. That's why he had to raise from the dead. He was the Holy One. Or Psalm 2, which describes the, the coronation of the King, that the Lord will set upon Zion, which even ends, Psalm 2, verse 12, kiss the Son. This is the Son of God. 
that this was. He would have gone on to the prophets, maybe talking about some of the fulfillment of the prophets, say from Micah chapter 5, verse 2, who promised that the Messiah would be born in Jerusalem. Right? Or maybe Zechariah 9, 9, which prophesied how the Messiah would come into Jerusalem riding in on a donkey. Or maybe Daniel chapter 9, the prophesied of the time of the coming of the Messiah. Exactly, like, like we're, we're way past the time. Right? Jesus came, and it, at this point it would have been some years before. But He came according to the prophecy of Daniel. Maybe He spoke that. Maybe he spoke about the manner of the ministry of Jesus from Isaiah chapter 35, which describes the ministry of Jesus, opening the eyes of the blind, or unstopping the ears of the deaf, or seeing lame men leap like the deer. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, we see that in the life of Jesus. Or, or Isaiah 53, which speaks about the suffering of the Messiah. Of course it had to take place that the Messiah would come and he would suffer and die. It's all prophesied. All we like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed, right? We're, we're healed through the wounds of the suffering of the Messiah. It's all talking about Jesus. Right? And, and he would have taken this, or taken a scroll, whatever he had, or from memory, all day long, would have just read a verse, gone through it, and verse by verse kind of talked about it and how this was fulfilled in Jesus. And maybe there's pushback and, and some questions. And back and forth they would have gone. And, and Paul may have even like, like extended beyond just those prophecies that speak explicitly of the Messiah. Could easily have gone to talk to passages like Isaiah 40 or Malachi 4, which speak about a forerunner. Elijah's going to come first. He talked about how John the Baptist fulfilled everything in that. Even John the Baptist came and he says, right, the kingdom of God is near, repent. So it's his message, right? It's, it's, he's talking, if, if you look here, he's, he's talking to them morning and evening about the kingdom of God. When, when John came, he was preaching about the kingdom coming. Maybe he would have gone on to some of the themes of Hebrews about how, how Jesus is better than the angels. Now he's, he's better than Moses. Like, like, like the, the builder of the house is, is better. Um, Jesus is better than, um, than the priests. He's better than Aaron. Right? He, he is the ultimate high priest who can come and sympathize us as he did because he experienced everything that we knew because he was in the flesh. And yet he was a better priest. Genesis 14, he was of the order of Melchizedek. Could have gone into Psalm 95 and speak about those things. and see, Psalm 110, rather, and speak about those things. That Jesus is the one, he's the, the better priest. And all, all day long, right? Peter or Paul would have done those things. What a seminar that would have been. Well, the results of the seminar were mixed. If you look at verse 24, and some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. Some were convinced, and others were disbelieved. And this is always the pattern in the book of Acts. Whenever the gospel was, was preached, some believed and others didn't. Whether it was in Antioch, when he came into the synagogue, right, there were some Jews who believed and, and many didn't and they cast him out of the synagogue. Or whether that was in places like Thessalonica, where there were some that followed and uh, others kicked him out of the town. Or, or in Athens, there were some that followed and some were like, well, maybe we'll hear him again, but some rejected. Oh, he's, he's, he's out of his mind. Or like those in Corinth or Ephesus, there's always some believed at the preaching of the gospel and others resisted. In our day here in America, in my experience at least, right, it's most don't believe when the gospel is put before people. They don't. So it's not that some believe and others don't. It's that few believe and many don't. But would the Holy Spirit come upon us like He he did in the days of the early church recorded in the book of Acts when revival was taking place. Right, Many would believe, but there would be many that would resist for sure. Verse 25, we see the, the mixed results. Verse 25, and disagreeing among themselves. So like Paul brought these things. It's no longer like they're disagreeing with Paul. All of a sudden they're like, oh, I think it's true. Oh, no, it's not true. Oh, yeah, no, you're going to be hurt. And so all of a sudden right, they're arguing among themselves about whether it's true or not. Um, they departed after Paul had made one statement. And here's like a final statement that he, he said, right? This is at 5 o'clock. The, 
The seminar's ending at 5 o'clock, and it's like 4.50 is when Paul made the statement. He said, the Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive, for the people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and turn and I would hear heal them. Right? Do you know where that passage comes from? Who knows that passage? Isaiah 6. Right? This, this is the great passage, that, the famous passage in the Old Testament. Was Isaiah is there in the throne room of God and sees the Lord high and exalted, right? his train of his robe filling the temple, and you have the seraphim right, with six wings, two cover his eyes and two cover his feet, with two he's flying, and, and the seraphim is saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And when, when Isaiah sees that vision, right, he's broken. He, he says, Isaiah chapter 6, he says, Woe is me, I am lost, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He, he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of an unclean lips. And I'm lost, I'm done, I'm broken. In light of God, who I am, I'm nothing. And then the seraphim took a coal and touched his lips and his lips were cleansed and he experienced for forgiveness and cleansing by this whole cleansing of touching the coal to his lips. And, and then the Lord says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Right? I've seen God, I've been broken, but I know I've been cured through Him. I'm here, like, send me. And so God says, okay, I'll send you. I'll send you on this mission of hardening. You go out and you preach, and no one will believe. God sends him. He says, preach to the people who will hear you, but they're not going to understand. They're going to see you, but they're not going to perceive. And that's what Paul did for an entire day. He preached the good news to the people, but many of them, their, their hearts were dull, their eyes were dim, and they refused to believe. And as Paul often did, after the, the Jews rejected the message, he turned to the Gentiles, right? Because the gospel is, right? It's to the Jew first and also the Greek. It's always the synagogue, give the Jewish people who have the scriptures, give them the first opportunity, and then when they reject it, then you, you go to the Greek. And that's what, what Paul said after affirming the hardness of these people. And, and this wasn't lost on the Jews, by the way. They knew Isaiah 6. They knew Isaiah 6 very well that basically it was says, I'm going to say and you're not going to understand. In fact, <clears throat> the idea is that the more Isaiah would speak, and Jesus, by the way, used this in parables, why he spoke in parables, that he might speak and put forth the kingdom of God in a veiled way that people might not see. And so also, like right here, right? He's going and he's preaching. And these people are hearing, but they're not understanding. They're kind of getting it, but they're not. And, and how many of you have come across people like that, that when you speak to them, like the gospel of Christ, they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a good person. Like, no, that's not it. That's not it. We're, we're evil and we need Jesus. Yeah, I know. I'm pretty good. I believe that. Like, no, you miss. Like, they just, they, phew, like ships in the night. And in, um, then in Paul, in verse 28, <clears throat> he, he says, okay, you Jews, Therefore, let it be known to you, this salvation of God has been sent. <clears throat> Therefore, let it be known to you <clears throat> that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. And then some manuscripts add, right? When he said these words, the Jews departed, having much dispute among themselves. And they're disputing among themselves. They departed, basically says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be going to the Gentiles. And that's what we see in verse 30 and 31, which we'll pick up next week. We'll see Paul preaching the Gentiles for for two years, proclaiming the, the kingdom of God. One of the things we're going to look at next week is just think about, okay, so when Paul was in prison, he was writing letters. He was preaching about the kingdom. Thankful that he was, he was there. He had time to write. And he had time to send letters to people which become the scriptures. But here's at this point, right? The Jews rejected it, and so he turned to the Gentiles. So at this point, we transition to the Lord's Supper I just place yourself in there. You're one of the Jews coming to listen to Paul. Are you believing him? Now, here, here right, we're, we're at church, right? So the, the percentages are different, right? You're not a hostile crowd. It's not like we're going to a university. We're coming here where we're, we're believing, right? But there may be some of you who are unbelieving, right? But I encourage you, right, just to think about the, the Lord's Supper as it's a chance for you to say, yes, I'm with Paul. 
I'm believing everything that he said about the, the old covenant. I'm believing everything about Jesus is the Messiah. And yes, I am in with Jesus. And that's really what the, the Lord's Supper is about. It's about us remembering Christ. Christ crucified, dead, buried, and then risen again. Remembering that night when he took the bread and the cup and he told us to, to this do in remembrance of me. And so we eat it and we drink it in remembrance of Jesus. It's an opportunity for you to say, yes, I'm in with Jesus. Right? It's not that we get anything special from the, the cup or the bread other than uh, Jesus says to do this and so we do it in, in remembrance of him. So why don't you bow your heads Spend some time just even examining your hearts, just even thinking about your own faith and belief and, and trust. And reaffirm that once, once more. It just says, Christ Jesus, I, I do love you. I do believe in you. I, I do trust, God, in your forgiveness. I, I do trust that you are the one, as Psalm 22 speaks about, who was forsaken by your Father, yet who was pierced upon the cross. He was the suffering servant who bore my sins. He was the Holy One who was not abandoned even to Sheol. And as I look upon Him who I have pierced in some ways metaphorically, I, I mourn for Him. And I, I realize that it's my sin that put Him upon the cross. Yet, Lord, we are thankful that you were pleased to crush your son, that he might become the sacrifice for our sins. And as you've instituted the Lord's Supper and told us to eat and to drink this way, as we're doing all the way through the season of Lent, I pray that it would draw us close to Christ and draw us to think about him crucified, risen from the dead, which is, which is our hope, which we celebrate in, in full gusto come Easter morning. So Father, be with us and convict us of our sin. God, show us again afresh of the glories of our Savior. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.